evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Christy McMorris. I'm the Dean of Bard Academy at Simon's Rock here. And as I begin, <laughs> as I begin, I would like to offer a special shout out and or acknowledgement to the classes of 2019. So if you, whether you are in Bard Academy or in Bard College of Simon's Rock, if you arrived here this weekend, can you please give yourself a round of applause and go seminar were, well, dead. <laughs> uh, and most of them were often European. And, so, and the faculty at that time decided there are lots of writers who are also alive and writing right now and telling the stories of the world in which we are living right now. And so this became a tradition to engage the writers who are walking among us and telling our own stories and telling their own stories in our contemporary moment. So book one allows us to engage the work of living writers whose work we can read and engage and who we can talk to. We can talk to y'all a little bit later. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we can do those, we can be, take part in those conversations without the assistance of a seance. So, we're really honored to be here this evening with our renowned speakers, Stephen Carter, Carter and his daughter, daughter Leah. Thank you so much for being here. Seen as the story of an extraordinary family and lineage. 
It might even be interpreted as part autobiography, uh, given, of course, that, as, as most of you know, uh, its subject is the author's grandmother, and his great-grandmother. Uh, the book shows, I think, that history is often best written and most enjoyable to read when historians have a personal connection with their research. Um, uh, I, I think uh, the result of our guest's uh, work is an incredible story of passion, perseverance, and even pain, centered around the inspiring but often difficult life and career of Eunice Hunton Carter. Long overdue for such a biography, Eunice enjoyed impressive accomplishments for her time, but she also suffered deep disappointments and frustrations, which I think we will hear about. Um, her work as a lawyer and political activist advanced civil rights and equality for both women and African Americans at a time when liberal and sympathetic white men, and even her mentors, as we read, passed over her, uh, when by all rights she deserved far greater and more profound recognition. And I think perhaps most important, our students have discovered that Invisible reminds us that in so many ways the oppressions endured by people of color and women, and women in Eunice's own day persist today, from racist police abuse and unaccountability to the communities that police serve, to pay inequalities between whites and non-whites, between men and women, just to name a few. Uh, the book invites, quote, a terrifying realization, in Stephen Carter's words, of the needs of the darker nation in the 1930s were little different from the needs of the darker nation today. So please welcome Stephen and Leah Carter. Because while my name uh, is on the book, it is it, it was her research and her project that helped uh, make the book what it is. It wouldn't have been nearly the extraordinary story that it is. I wouldn't have known as much as I knew about the family if Leah hadn't decided to um, uh, to really become a a full-time unpaid research assistant. <laughs> I guess that's what. Uh, is, is what she ended up uh, uh, doing. Um, in a minute, we're going to talk to you about little bits and pieces of the book, recognizing that most people here have read it, and we certainly want to take uh, time uh, for your questions. Uh, before we do, I want to say a couple of things, and Leah, I think, has a couple of things she wants to say. Uh, first, that although I have been a law professor, I hate to think of it, for 37 years, um, I, I think that uh, people outside of the rather narrow and arcane areas of law I write about, people who have known my work have mostly known my, my fiction, and I do enjoy um, writing fiction. Tackling the biography, uh, especially of someone as complex as Eunice, was a daunting uh, task. Um, there have been many biographers who have come along over the years who have been saying they wanted to try to do it, but no one had actually uh, uh, done it, and it puts me in awe of, um, well, of Justin and of other historians who may be uh, in the audience. I think of the amount of work that goes into trying to get things uh, exactly right, where someone was on a particular day, and, and so on. Um, if I'm writing a novel, it doesn't matter, I can make it up, but I didn't want to make anything like that. Uh, in this uh, book. So in a moment, I'm going to start out uh, talking particularly about uh, the time, uh, her involvement in the prosecution of, uh, of Lucky Luciano, but first, uh, Leah has a few things that she would like to say also. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having us. Um, this is really cool. We were um, just got a chance to have dinner 
from the few students and faculty. And I have to say, the students I met were super cool and impressive, and you seemed like a really awesome bunch of people. We were learning a little bit about the process you're going through now with um, ideas and writing. I can't remember what that's exactly what it's called, but it sounds so exciting. Um, and I'm very excited that we get to be part of it. I think that's really cool. Um, I also have to say we've given a few of these talks. I think these are the best chairs we've ever sat on. <laughs> I, like, I feel like I should be introducing like a movie on kind of classic movies. <laughs> but um, yeah, so thank you so much for having us. Yeah, these chairs are actually uh, pretty great. Uh, typically when we've done this, thing, we, this is like we were trying to figure out four or five times we sat together to talk about uh, uh, the book and usually just ordinary chairs, so this is nice. Uh, but, but let me uh, say a couple of words uh, about both where the book came from and, and a bit of, the, of Eunice's own uh, history. So Eunice, as you know, uh, if you didn't know, you just heard, was my grandmother. The story that you hear in the book, that you find in the book, is not a story that I knew when I was growing up. Um, in fact, when my grandmother was alive, she died when I was in high school, I didn't even know she was a lawyer. Um, and it just wasn't the kind of thing. Now, I admit, I grew up in the kind of family where nobody talks about anything anyway. It's not that just that children were seen and not, were supposed to be seen and not heard. Children were seen and not heard. It's a very stern family. And, uh, and my grandmother was part of that. Uh, my memories of my grandmother are of this powerful, brilliant, scary, even intimidating woman who would come to our house at the holidays and correct our grammar or tell us we were using the wrong dinner fork and, and, and so on. And for most of my life, um, that was the image I had of her. It was only in the process of writing this book that I came to understand the sorts of barriers that she had to overcome and the forces in the world that, in, in the teeth of which she created herself. In short, I came to be sympathetic to her and understand how she got the way that she was. To tell you, I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the story, although I know that you've, uh, you've read the book, most of you, and you're familiar with it, but I wanna focus in on a couple of details, nevertheless. I want you to picture uh, New York City in the 1930s. This was a mob-run city. There were a number of different ethnic mobs. Every color, every ethnic background, every religion had its own mobs. And there were a lot of mobs that, were in, that, that ran different parts of the city. Um, the fix was in pretty much everywhere. Everyone was on the take, particularly important for our purposes, the New York District Attorney. Um, an egregious creature named William Dodge uh, was on the take. Uh, and civic reformers, newspaper editors, and a lot of ordinary folks were constantly complaining that no one would do anything about the mob uh, and its control, its iron control over so much of the city. And things became so bad that uh, William Dodge, the crooked district attorney felt obliged to impale a grand jury to pretend to look into the mob, whereas really he didn't intend to indict anyone. And it was this grand jury that became known in the papers as the runaway grand jury that threw the DA's people out of the grand jury room and basically took the view that they, would, they wanted to investigate the mob, but they would not work within the DA's office. There was a big to-do about that, which is described in the book. The upshot was, in the end, that Dodge was forced by the governor, William Lehman, to appoint a special prosecutor uh, to look at the mob activity in New York. And the special prosecutor he appointed was, of course, Thomas Dewey, who later became well-known for for president and for the judgment of several papers, not just the Chicago Tribune, beating Truman in the election in 1948. We know that Truman actually won, but there's a famous photograph of Truman with holding up the uh, the Chicago Tribune, but the Washington Post, for example, also announced to its readers that morning that, uh, uh, that Dewey had won. Um, so Dewey was a special prosecutor. He was from Wall Street, where he commanded an enormous salary, he was a special prosecutor. 
commanded a very tiny salary, insisted on being able to hire his own staff. He wanted no one who had any connection with any New York prosecutors. Uh, he insisted on his own offices, which were closely guarded night and day, and so on and, and, and so on. Um, according to Dewey's biographer, one out of every six lawyers in New York City applied for a position on his staff. And he conducted many of the interviews, most of the interviews himself. In the end, he selected 20 lawyers. In fact, the name of his book about the process later on, his best-selling book he wrote later, was 20 Against the Underworld. The 20 lawyers were 19 white males and one black woman. And the black woman was my grandmother, uh, Eunice. Then Dewey went on the radio and he invited New Yorkers to come down to the office or to write letters how is the mob affecting you? What is it we need to clean up about organized crime? And immediately a problem arose because people came down to the office in droves, and people wrote letters in droves. And overwhelmingly, those letters and those visitors to the office were complaining not about loan sharking or gambling or influence peddling. They were complaining about brothels down the block. They were complaining about prostitution. This created a problem for Dewey. Dewey had political ambitions. He didn't want to be the prosecutor who went off and investigated prostitution, and he made that very clear in the office. But since there were so many people who wanted him to look into that, he had to have someone look into it. Well, he had 19 white men and one black woman, so of course the black woman was the one he chose to look into uh, prostitution uh, in New York, while the 19 white men went looking into loan sharking and gambling and murder and influence peddling and drug smuggling uh, and all the many other crimes that Dewey considered real crimes, the crimes he wanted to prosecute. But a problem arose. Uh, when Dewey was appointed, the head of the mob in New York, this the most powerful mobster, was a fellow who's gone down in history as, as Dutch Schultz. He wasn't really the head of the mob. He was really the face of the mob. The mob was largely being run by others behind the scenes, but nevertheless, he was the most prominent mobster in New York, and he's the one that Dewey wanted to get. Unfortunately, he got himself assassinated a few months after Dewey was appointed, in fact, literally three months after Dewey was appointed, in part because his fellow gangsters were afraid he was going to try to kill Dewey. Um, after that, Michael Luciano slowly became the head of the mob in New York, and that was where Dewey finally put his sights. But here's where the problem arose. In spite of all of these investigators, not only as 19 white male lawyers, but also the many, many uh, police investigators who worked for them, he could not connect Luciano to gambling, to loan sharking, and so on and so on. But Eunice, laboring alone in a little office at the end of the hall, furthest from Dewey, had taken the view that if they give you lemons, make lemonade. And so she was assigned to work on the prostitution angle, which everyone knew, Dewey said it over and over again, was not a case he was ever going to prosecute. And yet, bit by bit, over the weeks and months, she was able to put together a case connecting Black Luciano to prostitution in New York. Now I'm going to the details of the case. They're in the book. You've, you're probably familiar with them. The point is, she went repeatedly to Dewey trying to persuade him to prosecute this case, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't even believe it was true. He didn't think it was possible that a crime like prostitution could have any kind of central apparatus that ran it. Eunice was convinced that uh, it wasn't so much a matter of running it as that the crime was taxed. That is, that everyone, all the brothels and so on, all paid a tax to the mob for protection. Eventually, uh, Dewey allowed Eunice to do some wiretaps, and not long after that, a couple months later, he let her uh, organize a raid 
and a massive raid on 80 different properties. And after the raid, they were slowly, slowly, she and some of the others, uh, able to prove the connection of Luciano with prostitution. I mention all this uh, because, in the end, that was the case that Dewey tried, the case he said he didn't want to try. Um, and when it came time to try the case, uh, Dewey had to decide which lawyers would try the case with him. Now, Eunice, by that time, was an experienced trial lawyer. She had developed the case and interviewed most of the major witnesses. She had collected the evidence that tied, and, and critically prepped the witnesses who tied Luciano directly to prostitution. Um, but he chose instead four white males who were working on other things to try the case uh, uh, with him. And while Eunice had a role in the preparation for the case, and also was charged with taking care of some of the witnesses whose lives were at risk, she had no formal courtroom role in the case. Nevertheless, Luciano was convicted. And when he was convicted, um, Two things happened, well, a lot of things happened, but two of them were, one is that Dewey made a point of thanking her at length uh, when uh, he held his first press conference after the verdict. The other is that she suddenly became famous. That for, there was a period in the 1930s and early 40s when she was actually one of the most famous black women in America. She was profiled in Life magazine uh, and also in greater length in something called Liberty magazine, which although it's long dead now, was at that time the second biggest circulation magazine uh, in the country. Uh, she was on the radio with, on, on, on the same program with um, various movie stars, uh, Vivian Lee and, and, and so on. Uh, she got an award at the at a special event for women of the world at the New York World's Fair in 1939 and so on and so on and so on. She became quite prominent uh, as a result of this, uh, of this trial. But what's striking to me, and I'll tell you more about her life after the trial in a little while, what's striking to me about this was the degree of fortitude that was required. You have to, again, picture her pushed off into a corner, assigned to work that her boss himself had said he was never going to prosecute, meaning she was beginning with work that he was not taking seriously. And yet from that beginning, the fortitude that she showed, that she displayed through her whole life, the determination enabled her to build this case bit by bit against the opposition of her own boss and almost all the other lawyers uh, in the office. So who was she, this Eunice uh, Carter? How did she develop this fortitude? What sort of family produced her? That's what uh, Leah, I think, is going to talk about for a few minutes. Yes, so most of my research on the book focused on Eunice's family um, and a little bit on her childhood. And so just to talk about Eunice's childhood, I started in 1906 when she was seven years old and there was a race riot in Atlanta. So a mob of angry white citizens went rampaging through the town, um, destroying black homes and especially businesses. Um, the family lore is that uh, the mob stopped one short family, one house short of the house where Eunice lived with her family. Um, in any case, whether that is exactly true or not, in any case, their house was unharmed and they were unharmed, but they, like thousands of other black families, fled Atlanta after that and moved to New York. And so these people, this family, living in this house, um, there was Eunice and her parents and her little brother. So I want to talk first about her father, William Hunton. Uh, William Hunton was born in Ontario, in Chatham, Ontario. Uh, he was the son of a man named Stanton Hunton, who was born enslaved in Virginia. Um, again, according to family lore, he escaped from slavery three times. Uh, he was ultimately caught every time, but he eventually bought his freedom. Um, and ultimately moved to Ontario where he became a successful businessman and um, raised several children, including William. And the way that he raised his children, he was a very strict, uh, strict disciplinarian. And my favorite anecdote about William's childhood is that 
he used to, he gave the kids a ton of chores, especially boys. He believed that boys should be systematically industrious. And he gave them a ton of chores, and if they finished their chores and had nothing to do, he would make them just carry piles of bricks from one side of the lawn to the other. Just pick them up, carry them, put them down, pick them up, carry them. Down. And I think this really informs who William grew up to be because he was incredibly disciplined and determined. Um, he eventually moved to the United States and he worked for the YMCA and he traveled all around the world opening, uh, starting and helping to start what were then called colored YMCA branches. Um, William was incredibly religious. He really believed in the mission of the YMCA, which is a very different organization from what it is now. Um, when it was, you know, the Young Men's Christian Association, he really believed that um, Christian education was very important for um, young black men. And he really, he traveled all over the world doing this work. He um, dined at Buckingham Palace at one point. And ultimately, I think he worked himself to death doing this. He was constantly sick, but he just worked this incredibly punishing schedule where he was traveling from place to place. Um, and he eventually died of tuberculosis. And that, so um, there's a, another great story about William is when he, um, this is, um, he and his wife in the 1890s were on a train car in the South, a segregated train car. And for context, 1896 is when the Supreme Court decided Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the case in which they determined that um, separate but equal public accommodations were acceptable for black and white people. Segregation was okay as long as the accommodations were equal. Um, and so, and that was the case about a railroad car. And so they were on a segregated railroad car, they were sitting in a white car, and the conductor came and told them to move. And so in this context, there they are sitting, and they have been told to move by the conductor. And William just calmly, apparently, talked the conductor into letting them sit, letting them remain in the train car. We don't know the details of that conversation, but he must have been incredibly persuasive. And that story comes from a book written about William by his wife, um, Adelina, who went by Addie. Um, she was born Adelina Lawton sometime in the 1860s. We don't know exactly when because she lied about her age all the time throughout her life, um, giving different ages and different birthdays in different contexts. Um, but she, Addie grew up to be uh, a very prominent activist and speaker. Um, she used to, she traveled all around the country. Um, one of the things she did that I think was so amazing and impressive is she used to travel to areas of the country that um, were really um, being terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan. And she would travel there on her own as a black woman alone. And just to reassure, she did this on behalf of the NAACP, just to reassure the local NAACP chapters that the national organization hadn't forgotten about them. And, um, that to me is like the most, just when I think of her and her incredible determination and how just fearless she was, um, that's it's such an inspiring story. Um, she also, uh, during World War I, went to um, Europe uh, to, they had sort of sent women with the soldiers to like, you know, help them and sort of feel like it's kind of a mother role for the soldiers and um, for all of the black soldiers. They sent like two black women, um, whereas the white soldiers, of course, had more women who went with them. But um, and she wrote, uh, she and other women who went with her, whose name is now escaping me, um, wrote Catherine Johnson um, wrote a book called uh, Two Colored Women with the American Expeditionary Forces." Uh, and one of the things that Addie is most known for is a talk she used to give. She she traveled a lot and spoke a lot, and one of the things she talked about all the time was the importance of um, motherhood in the black community, the importance of you know women being home, raising their children, that that was the most important thing that black women could do for their race. Uh, which I always think is really fascinating because Addie was almost never home to her children. She was off <laughs> giving these lectures. And so Eunice and her younger brother, Alpheus, his name was William Alpheus, he went by Alpheus, um, grew up in this sort of, they were constantly sort of moving um, from relative to relative and um, staying with family friends and um, just both of their parents were on the road constantly. And, you, or, oh, sorry, Alpheus was also an interesting person in his own right. He grew up to be a, um, a professor of Victorian literature and a very dedicated communist. Um, and not a 
like in a you know really like thought Mao and Stalin were both awesome. That's like serious fun. And like he um, you know would ultimately go to jail for refusing to name names during the McCarthy era. Um, but um, so Eunice definitely you know they grew up in this sort of like tumultuous environment with these two incredibly impressive and powerful parents who. I feel it kind of came and went from their lives a lot. And when Eunice was eight, so it was a year after, 1907, a year after the riots, she was on vacation with her family in New Jersey, and she was, met a little boy, and they were playing on the beach. And apparently he asked her what she wanted to do when she grew up, and she said she wanted to be a lawyer because she wanted to make sure the bad guys went away. Um, and we sort of imagine that that has something to do potentially with her memories of the riot, which since we don't know exactly how the riot affected them, we don't know what her, exactly what her memories were, but I'm sure that that influenced in some way her sense that, you know, she wanted to see society protected from bad people, the people who wanted to harm others. And in any case, whatever her motivation, um, after some digressions and uh, different paths she considered in life, that's ultimately what she grew up to do. So, um, so you know what Eunice did with now with Luciano, and you know uh, where uh, she came from. I want to say a few words about what happened after the Luciano trial, what happened with the rest of her career. Then I think we're going to stop and take and and, and take questions. Um, so I told you that the trial uh, made her one of the most famous black women in America for a brief period of time. Well, for almost a decade, I guess, but. What became interesting was that she worked on various tri other trials at the DA's office. She worked on various raids because Dewey, after he was finished being special prosecutor, he ran for New York prosecutor and he was elected. But even as she worked on these various projects, um, somehow she never got to try the big cases. There were other big cases, I won't go into the years now, they're in the book, that she worked on preparing where again, she wouldn't be part of the trial team. This happened again and again. On the other hand, uh, when Dewey became DA, he assigned her to run what was in those days called Special Sessions, which is basically the Misdemeanor Bureau, which is by far the biggest bureau of the office, and where, as the black newspapers gleefully reported, uh, she had a staff of several dozen white male lawyers who reported uh, uh, to her. Now. Uh, Dewey was a Republican. Uh, Eunice uh, was a Republican. Uh, Dewey was what those days would be called a liberal Republican. I think it's fair to say Eunice was a pretty conservative Republican. She was much more conservative than, than uh, uh, Dewey. I think she's conservative enough that uh, I might be invited to talk about, about her, what she did, but I don't think many college campuses would invite her to come and, uh, uh, and speak about what she did. Um, I mention this because uh, Dewey, of course, had dreams of higher office. Uh, and so he ran, was like a governor, and then he ran several times for president. And each of his campaigns, he talked about Eunice. And she got other campaigns with him. She campaigned with him for DA. She campaigned with him for the governorship. She campaigned with him for president. Uh, and he would talk about, when he was running for governor, he would say, you know, a black woman is the head of the biggest bureau in the DA's office where I am now. He would say that again and again. When he ran for president, he ran president three times, actually. History usually tells you he ran twice. He ran three times. In 1940, he didn't get the nomination, although he arrived at the convention with the most delegates, but he didn't get the nomination. He got the nomination in 44 and lost in a landslide to Roosevelt. He got the nomination in 48 and lost to Truman. What was interesting about when he was the standard bearer in 44 and 48, both times uh, Dewey ran on the most progressive civil rights plank of any presidential candidate to that point in the nation's history. Certainly far more progressive than the Democrats of the day, who were so dominated by the Dixiecrats that, uh, that FDR, for example, as I mentioned in the book, wouldn't allow um, black reporters to cover uh, presidential press conferences because it might upset the uh, southern white constituency that he needed to get, uh, uh, to get elected. Um, 
So he ran on these very progressive civil rights platforms. He traveled the country talking about civil rights, something no national politician had ever done. And again, Eunice did a lot of campaigning for him, and he talked about her a lot in interviews uh, and elsewhere. Um, and of course, he lost. I'm not saying he lost because he ran the civil rights platform, but of course, that's also uh, that's also possible. Now, of course, by this time, the DA's office had passed into other hands. Eunice was in the DA's office from 1935 to 1945, and she waited and waited and waited for promotion. And while she got to head this or that, she never really rose very high in the office. Certainly, never reached a point that her skills might have been. Titled her to. After she left the DA's office in 1945. Um, she still had dreams of being a judge. That's what she really wanted more than anything else, was she wanted to be a judge. Um, and she never got to be a judge. And there were reasons to think she was going to get this judge over that judge, but they always went to someone else. Now, Leah mentioned to you uh, Eunice's younger brother, Alpheus, who was a communist. Um, and as Leah said, when we say communist, we don't mean that he was a lefty who was falsely called a communist. He was a communist. He was a ranking member of the Communist Party and very likely performed um, tasks on behalf of Soviet intelligence as well. His FBI file is over 700 pages long, making it more than twice as long as, say, to take an example, uh, Martin Luther King's file or or uh, Malcolm X's file, and, and, and so on. Um, and today, looking back on Eunice's career, we might say that the failure to rise further was a result of race, a result of gender, the results of the intersection of the two, although there were black people and even black women at the time who rose to some of the positions she wanted. But whatever the actual cause was, Eunice, to her dying day, would believe that it was because of her brother. That was because of her brother, that her, her communist brother held her back, that no one wanted to be the one who appointed someone who had that brother to office. That was her theory, whether it was right or wrong. But if Eunice couldn't rise in that career, one of the aspects of her fortitude and determination was she would try to rise somewhere else. She became involved in international organizations, largely international women's organizations that have variety of international uh, peace organizations as well. She was part of the uh, uh, conference at which the UN was founded in San Francisco, and she wasn't supposed to be a formal delegate, but she just kind of pulled her way in uh, and became a participant in uh, uh, in the conference. Uh, she also she was a, a, a popular uh, speaker, and she spoke on topics that people weren't talking about at the time. So, for example, in 1938 or 1939, I can't remember the year, uh, she gave a fascinating talk about what would nowadays called sexual harassment. This is a time, remember, when the notion was that women shouldn't even be in the workforce, but if they were, they should be grateful for the job and shouldn't be complaining about the conditions. Um, Eunice gave a speech in which she talked about um, men who, as she put it, exact an intimate relationship from women uh, for them in order to have or hold jobs. And she said, um, she said, boiling in oil is a little too good for that kind of man, she said. Uh, and these were issues that said no one was talking about it. There was a bravery uh, in doing that. She gave a lot of other brave speeches, a lot of other, it was involved in other important international activities. But she never got the kind of recognition she really wanted. She never got what she yearned for. And in particular, she never became a judge and there were other things she wanted. There was talk of her getting a high position in Washington a couple of times. Uh, there was talk of her getting a high position in Albany. None of them ever happened. And I said, she believed it was because of her brother. And in fact, she and her brother became estranged. In 1951, as Leah told you, he went to prison during the McCarthy era for refusing to name names. He went to prison uh, along with his good friend Dashiell Hammett, the writer, um, and there was a worldwide outcry at Dashiell Hammett going to, to prison at the time, but not for Alpheus uh, going to prison. Um, my father, um, who at that time was a young lawyer, Eunice's son, uh, wanted to visit his uncle 
who he adored in prison, and his mother absolutely forbade it. Um, and my father always told me that when Alpheus got out of prison, that he and Eunice never spoke again. I don't know if it's literally true they never spoke. They clearly um, were in touch. We had like, some correspondence, and I got some other from my brother. They certainly corresponded <coughs> a little bit. Um, but there was a lot of resentment there, and it was and it was lifelong. You have to imagine this conservative Republican woman and this really hard-edged communist true believer. As Leah said, he was a great admirer of, of Stalin. In fact, he would circulate each year um, a, te a, a telegram, not a telegram, sorry, he would circulate a request for signatures on a telegram wishing best birthday wishes to Comrade Stalin uh, every, uh, uh, every year. I want to say two more things only about Eunice, and, and then I will stop and take uh, uh, your questions. Um, uh, the first thing that I want to say is that in all of this, uh, all the things that she did, this is a time, as you know, when, for example, when she went to law school, um, when women didn't go to law school, certainly black women uh, didn't go to law school, most of the, what we now think is the big law schools, didn't even admit women. Um, they were male only. In fact, and I'll you know, start from another time. As some of you may be aware, there was a phenomenon at the time. Historians have written about uh, the so-called women's law schools that opened often in the shadow of places like Harvard and Yale, yeah, literally in the shadow nearby, specifically to train women who could have gone to those law schools but for the bar against admitting them. Um, and of course, the big law schools got them closed down as fast as they would uh, as they would open. Um, she went to Fordham. The Catholic schools were the main place in those days where women could study law, where black people could study law, where Jews and Catholics could study law, and where immigrants could study law. This is a time of a very waspy bar. Um, and, play, and, and places like Harvard and Yale and Columbia put enormous obstacles in the path of graduates of those schools simply to become lawyers. They to jump through additional hoops that other people didn't uh, uh, didn't have to. This is one small example of the many different kinds of barriers, the self-belief that one had to have as a black woman in order to pursue this at a time like that. The other thing I want to mention is to go back, circle back to where I began. Uh, so when I wrote this book, I don't exactly know why I started to write it, why I became interested in really doing these, discovering these stories. Um, but I really did come to understand Eunice better. She became real to me in a way that she wasn't when she was my nana who scared me um, uh, to death. And I think it's fair to say that not only did, but did this project help me to understand my grandmother, it helped me to learn to love her as well. And for that, I'm very, very Grateful. Why don't we stop there and take, and take uh, questions? Sorry. Uh, thank you. So, if you have questions, you can direct them to me or to Leo or to both of us. Generally, I'll ask to keep them short because it's a big audience. Since you don't have microphones, we will try to repeat the question, or more likely, we'll repeat the question we wish you'd ask instead. <laughs> How's that? I think yours is the first hand up, sir. Darren the Red. What was that like for your childhood? For my childhood? Yeah. Huh. Um, all right, that's a fair question. I'm sorry. Oh, the question was since in, thank you. The question was that since in Invisible, um, I talk about, and it's true, that my father had a difficult childhood with Eunice and had the sense that she was constantly sending him away. And the reason you have that sense was because she was constantly sending <laughs> away. Um, but my childhood wasn't like that. Um, so we had, my sibling and I had a very 1950s kind of childhood. So um, my father was always going off and, and doing whatever it was that he was doing. He was always going to the office. Um, and my mom, 
uh, mostly um, uh, uh, took care of us. And I think my mom told me once that my father was an only child, and he was extremely lonely. And she said that my father wanted to have a big family, uh, so his children wouldn't be lonely. Uh, there were five uh, of us uh, uh, in uh, five, five children in my family. But I will say that the stern distance um, of my grandmother was also my father's way. He was a, he was a brilliant man, but he was a distant man. He, was a, he had a kind of generally disapproving air when he looked at the world and looked at at us, and, and he, was the kind, he was the kind of person, and some of you don't sure have parents like this, he's the kind of person who, if you got a 95, want to know why it wasn't a 97, if you got a 97, want to know why it wasn't, why it wasn't 100. That was, that was uh, uh, I think, what he learned from his experiences with his, uh, with his mother. More questions. More questions. Yes, on the end there. Um, and I think that 
it's become, it's like a, and so one of the ways this plays out is now as a society we've pretty much all agreed, I'm about to get like all of we've pretty much all agreed racism is bad, right? Everybody, if you ask them, like almost no one will say, yeah, racism is good. Everyone will say racism is bad. In fact, it's so terrible that you can't ever call anyone a racist because that's the worst thing you could ever say and then we have to have a whole conversation about how the word's racist. But um, there was a time, like it was different, I think discrimination functioned very differently and so the ways that you needed to deal with discrimination functioned differently in a world where people would just say, you know, no black people allowed here, the way that you deal with that discrimination is very different from the way you deal with discrimination now, which is a much more, um, it can be much more, I think, insidious. Um, and I would say it's, it's certainly not as widespread as it was, but it's um, it's harder, I think, and as it's become a more slippery thing um, to talk about race and to deal with race in a world in which everyone acknowledges that racism is bad, and everyone, and we'll say just, you know, nobody does that anymore. We don't have racism anymore. Um, so I guess one thing I would say that we need is sort of a new, which we're getting, this is, you know, so we're sort of evolving as a society, but to have a new framework for thinking about race and new um, language and different ways of thinking about it that address the ways that discrimination works now. I, I want to add, I, I'm glad you put it earlier, I want to add one more thing to that, that we tend, that there's a, a friend of mine who's a, a professor at, at Harvard, um, a law professor at Harvard, who writes about race a lot and likes to say that the problem we have today is that we're looking at a new world through an old lens. And so we tend to look today for the easy targets. That person said a word I don't like. That person gave a speech I don't like. We're looking, we're looking at the easy targets. We're not dealing with the deeper problems, with the deeper problems of not only of things like unconscious bias, which is easy to name but very hard to define, and actually often difficult to extract from the data. You have to be very careful how you define categories like this. Those are harder to deal with, and so we, instead of dealing with that, with all the subtlety and nuance, we say, well, let's yell at this guy who, you know, said these terrible things, which doesn't, which doesn't really move the ball forward as far as trying to deal with the sorts of more insidious things that, that Leah is, um, uh, is, is talking about. Other questions? Some of them I hope about the, uh, about the book. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so reading it, I noticed that most of the book is about Jewish Given that, do you think that despite her um, race and gender, that she came from a place of privilege? That she came from a place of privilege? Well, the question always is compared to what? That is to say, uh, what happened in, in the middle class of African America at that time was that people who were excluded from all these other sorts of, of status symbols began to invent their own. Uh, you couldn't join white tennis clubs, people created black tennis clubs. You couldn't join white social organizations, people created black social organizations. Certainly, within her community, she was better off in a lot of ways than the great majority of people. There's no question um, about that. But it was striking in a way that, I mentioned her strong conservatism, that there was a strong solidarity in those days through the community without regard to uh, political partisanship, say, around certain issues that affected everybody. So that however high you might rise within the community, there were still aspects in which to outsiders, especially to white outsiders, you were ordinary. There was nothing special uh, uh, about you. There wasn't, you know, someone mentioned Oprah at dinner. There wasn't any Oprah. There was no one who had that kind of, of uh, transcendent uh, uh, role. Um, I was just thinking, yeah, I do think, as you said, like compared to most uh, black people in the United States at the time, um, yeah, I do think she came from a place of privilege. Um, although, yeah, again, it's sort of a question of what you're comparing her to, but yes, I think she did have a certain amount of privilege in her life. Let's go back over to this side of the room. Yes. 
And then I'm going to go across and yes, come here, right here. Why her name's not in the title? What were you? What, what title were you giving it? Um, I don't know. I just felt like maybe her name could have been in the subtitle. Huh? What do you think? <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, so her, we, but the title actually went through several iterations, um, and I don't remember there ever actually being a question of putting her name in the title. But um, my thought about that is, on the one hand, it would be great to have a title with her name in it. On the other hand, she doesn't really have a lot of name recognition. And so if it were called like Invisible, the Eunice Hunting Carter story or something similar, um, I think people would look at that and be like, I don't know who that is. I'm not sure why that's something I should want to read. Whereas the subtitle, which I think is a little long, but is very descriptive, does get across like, here's why you should want to read this book, because it's about this black woman who did this thing. Yeah, I, I agree with all the other I, I think actually the title is pretty bad, but there weren't any good ones. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's, it's, titles are really hard. So I thought I write fiction and I write nonfiction. My fiction books, my novels, I mostly like the title. They're actually really good, except for one of them that I really hate. But my, my nonfiction books, almost without exception, I think have absolutely dreadful titles. And I don't know why that is, except that I know that when I write fiction, I always have the title before I start. By the way, Ray Bradbury once said that they should never start a novel until you have a title. So if you don't have a title, you don't know what you're writing about. And he wrote this essay with all these unused titles he said he's putting out there for people to use. And, and my favorite one, which actually somebody wrote a story with later on, it was a science fiction story, went years later, somebody used the title, was, I believe, uh, In the Attic Where the Meadow Greens. Isn't that a great title? So, Brad Bird and your Reverend wrote the story, someone else did. Um, one other thing I, I do want to say um, about the title. Apparently, um, titles are much more important in selling books than they used to be a few decades ago. Uh, and so, what happens now, especially with nonfiction, is you might end up with a kind of corporate title where all these they have committees and everything trying to figure out what the title was. And that's what happened with this book. This book had committees that were constantly coming up with new. Uh, titles. I can't remember. There was a when the original outline of the book had a title, but I don't remember what it was. This is uh, it's not, not I, I honestly don't remember. It's so many titles ago that I don't I, I, I don't remember. Okay, let's get another one in the middle, further back, and then we'll go over to the the side again. I thought I saw one way in the back where it's dark, but maybe not. No, I see. I, I put this one forward. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this is a question for Leah. Um, uh, I wanted to know that as a black female lawyer, and Eunice Carter was also a black female lawyer, when you were doing research about her, did you find that it changed the way you saw or did your job? Um, what's your question? Oh, yes. So, um, as a black female lawyer like Eunice, um, did doing the research change the way that I saw or did my job? Um, so I actually left my job to do research for the book. Um, so I was a lawyer at a big firm for four years, and um, I was, and I left uh, and worked on Invisible for two years, and I haven't gone back uh, to practice. I might go back to practice. I, I don't know if I'll go back to practicing, but I haven't yet. Um, but um, I'm trying to think if it may, so it certainly did change the way I did my job, um, but whether it changed the way I saw my job, not really. I think I recognized um, some similar frustrations to the frustrations you just had, although I have to say my experience was very different because um, I was not nearly as ambitious as this. I like, went to a law firm because I was like, well, I graduated from law school, it's what I do, here I go. And Eunice was a very, one thing that really impressed me about her um, when I was doing research, she was intensely ambitious. She was so, she really wanted to achieve things. And I think more than anyone in her family, um, this is a little bit of a digression, but I think um, her parents and her brother were all very mission driven. They had strong ideas about the way the world should be and how to make the world a better place, and they dedicated their lives to that. And I think Eunice had a lot of ideas about how to make the world a better place, and that was very important to her, and her activism was really important to her. But she also, I think, more than the other members of her family, wanted to advance herself and her own position. Um, 
so in any case, I think I when, yeah when I went into the law firm, I think that I can I can relate to some of the frustrations she had, but for me they weren't as salient because I was kind of like well I'm gonna leave here. So, um, but yeah, but I do think there were some similar uh, struggles there. Take one in the front now. Yes, right there. Um, I want to know what your experience was growing up in the civil rights movement. What was my experience like growing up in the civil rights movement? You know, it, first of all, it makes me feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do I feel old now. I'm just gonna, you know, have some hot milk and <laughs> lie down and let you all stay up and party. Uh, so, I, I only have birth and civil rights movement. What I mean by that is this, that my parents tried very hard to shelter us from a lot that was uh, going on. Different parents had different ways of thinking about how to deal with the civil rights movement, the freedom struggle with their own uh, kids and, and, and my parents tried to shelter us. On the other hand, um, in the March on Washington, um, we, my parents told me we went and we marched. We had our little NAACP hats and we marched on the mall um, with, uh, with everyone else back in 1963. Uh, uh, my father, as I learned later, um, who was in the federal government at the time, was, worked in part uh, as a liaison uh, between first the Kennedy and then the Johnson administrations and the civil rights uh, uh, community. And, and not long before he died, um, I heard a story from um, Marion Wright Edelman, um, who, you know, was the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, um, about when she was doing voting registration work in Mississippi uh, in 1965. Um, and my father uh, came down on behalf of the Johnson administration for this big meeting they were having. And, uh, and the Klan threatened to break up the meeting. Um, said that everyone, basically everyone's going to die if they have this meeting. Well, you have to understand, this is a very different area. There's nobody to call. You know, there's, no, there's nobody you can go get who's going to come and protect you. Right? It happened to you. Know, and, and Marion Redelman told me that you know, my father was on behalf of the government said, well, I think we just have a meeting and see what happens. And so they did, and nothing, and, and nothing happened. That was the kind of story I didn't know about uh, at the time. I, I did know that my father once got a death threat from the Klan when I was in junior high school. It was a letter it came in the mail in Washington, D.C. Uh, from a Klan organization in the Midwest, I think in Indiana. But I, in the end, maybe Michigan, I'm not sure, anyway, it was a death threat. Um, my father had been on television saying something apparently controversial, and got a, a death threat, and, and I got home from school, my mother opened the envelope, she was so upset, my father came home, he took it and went away, and went away to the office with a death threat, and we never heard anything about it uh, again. What I do remember, though, keenly, is when Martin Luther King was killed, um, which I found out about because I, I found my mother um, crying in the kitchen. Uh, which, ironically, was how I also found out about Robert Kennedy being killed two months later. It was exactly the same thing. I found my mother crying in the kitchen, and that was how, those, how I found out about those things. Um, the last point I'll make, which again is about my age. Um, so, in the, in the 1990s, um, I was a big uh, Bill Clinton uh, uh, supporter, and I actually got to know him a little bit, and my father uh, knew him already. And I remember talking to my father on the phone um, at that time and telling him how excited there was, and I had, had a chance to be a really great president and so on. And, you know, you can decide what you want about whether he was a good president or not, but this was my view uh, at the time. And I was telling my father how excited I was, and, and there's this long pause, and, and then my father said, so I'm glad you found someone to believe in. He said, everyone I believed in, they killed. He said. Um, and what's interesting about that was this is 1990s. I wasn't a kid anymore. I was well on my career. But it was, in a sense, the first conversation that we'd ever had about that era, even though he was my father and we lived and we both uh, lived through it. It's a great question. I wish I could give a better answer of, of what it was 
We probably have time for a couple more questions. Okay. I said I'd come back over to the slide. So right there. Yes. Well, so I think they, um, we both um, thought that Alpheus was really fascinating and there should have been more about Alpheus. <laughs> yeah, like, Alpheus is really interesting. Um, and I, maybe this is just because I spent um, a fair amount of time doing research on him. Um, and, because I, I spent more time doing research on, I think I mentioned this before, more time doing research on Eunice's family than on Eunice herself. And so, and, I just think Alpheus is a really fascinating character, um, but there didn't end up being, obviously he's mentioned um, and discussed in the book, but there wasn't as much about him and sort of going into his life and um, who he was, as I think would have been really interesting. Yeah, I actually agree that's the thing I most would have liked to see more of. Alpheus' own life was fascinating. I told you that he went to prison in the 50s, and we had always told you for a reason to name names, so this is a fellow who had, he had a master's degree from Harvard and a PhD from NYU. He was one of the nation's leading experts on Tennyson, in particular on Tennyson's social circle, Tennyson's friends, you might say. Um, and he used to write about that. Um, but after he got out of prison, he couldn't get any work, he couldn't get published. He worked in a factory for a while. Um, he finally left the country. Um, he moved first to Ghana, and then after the coup, he moved on to Zambia. Um, I say after the coup, like it's fresh in your memory. <laughs> after the coup in Ghana, which I believe was 1965, someone correct me if I'm wrong, uh, then he moved on to uh, Zambia, which is where he died. Um, but I think he was a fascinating character. I'd have loved to have said more about him. It was fascinating when he was young, also. He never had any children. He was married three times, and each marriage was scandalous. I talked a little bit about that in the book. We, originally, before we slumped down, there was a lot more about his scandalous marriages, first because he married a showgirl, as they used to call them, which just wasn't done in his part of society. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, while still married to the showgirl, he started running around with another woman um, in Washington very publicly and openly, and then eventually divorced the showgirl, and he and this other woman got married, her name was Margaret Reynolds. And a few years after that, he started running around with another woman um, uh, named Dorothy, Williams, who he eventually uh, left um, Margaret for, and then married her. And if you believe his FBI file, which he certainly don't have to do, there were other women uh, uh, as well. He was uh, quite the, the womanizer um, uh, as well. But I would really like to know more about his activities. I'd love to have delved more into his connections, for example, with Soviet intelligence uh, and so on. But there just wasn't room for everything in the book, and there wasn't time to do it. Which still began research. There wouldn't be any uh, uh, any book yet. The one other thing I want to say very briefly that I would like to be able to talk more about. I we tried in the book uh, to paint a picture. I think we did a pretty good job painting a picture of Harlan of the 1930s and 40s. We tried to make Harlan practically a character in the story. But I was also fascinated by the Atlanta of Eunice's youth. And I feel that although we talked about it, there's a fair amount about it, we didn't really bring it to life in the same way. We didn't spend as much time on it. And I think that that chapter of history was fascinating. I think Eunice's life there and her family's life was fascinating. I would have liked to have found uh, space for more than that. But as my editor told me, uh, he had a way with words. And uh, this also goes to the question of why her name wasn't in the title. I think you were the one asked about that. He said, you can't write a page biography about someone nobody's ever heard of. He said, so uh, it had to be short uh, because we were trying to get people to come and learn about someone they didn't know as opposed to try to learn more about someone they'd heard of uh, before. More time for one more question. So I would come back uh, to the middle. Let me see. I thought there was a hand in the back before that I never uh, that I never uh, got to. Okay, you're gonna have the last question right there. I know there are a lot of other questions. I'm happy to hang around with the answers on them, but you can have the last one. I will do that also, but go ahead. It's not a novel. It's <laughs>
recognize the Democratic Party as the party of like hate and bigotry. And I was wondering in your guys' opinion, if you think um, that's still, still true or when that changed around what time of history or what era? Well, Lee is young, so she'll have a different view on this than I. I don't get into partisan politics very much. It's not. I, 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 <laughs> but, but, but again, remember that sentence that, that Eunice's view of the Democratic Party was shaped by history, was shaped by the moment um, in which she lived. And I've often been asked, you know, what part of she be a part of day and so on. I don't know. It's forever view that kind of counter history. It's a really interesting question. We could debate it endlessly and have a seminar on it for two hours, but I we still wouldn't know what uh, the answer is. It's a great question, but I wouldn't know how to answer it. So I'll let you do it. <laughs> and this is also at the closing word because we're you know, out of time. Um, okay, so I, I don't, so this is a very complicated question. Um, I know a lot has been written about, so when Eunice was coming up, Eunice was Republican, her parents were Republicans, when she was coming up, most black people were Republicans because, you know, the Democrats were the, as my dad said, the secret party, they were the party of segregation. Um, and at a certain point, or throughout the middle of the 20th century, um, that sort of switched. Um, a lot of black people moved over to the Democratic Party, and there were a lot of reasons for that, and there's um, some interesting stuff that's been written about that. Um, and, yeah, I have no idea how you know, we feel about our current politics. I do, I, I'll say about my own political, well, I don't my own political things too much, but like, I guess, I think that racial politics um, today sometimes get painted in a very sort of simplistic light in terms of partisan politics, in terms of like, certainly as a black person, I think there's a sense that these are the people who are your friends, and these are the people who are your enemies, and it's very simple, and you always have to side with these people, and I'm sometimes like, well, you know, these people haven't really done as much for me as you think, or as they, you know, claim to, but, um, yeah, so I think that it's, I think that's complicated, but the, the history of sort of the switch um, of a lot of black Americans from um, we're open to the Democratic Party. I think it's really interesting, and I, it's something I actually um, am interested in learning more about. So I guess that's that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you.